Welcome to the inner world of filmmaking. I'm your host, Tammy McGarrow. I'm an editor, podcaster, and still photographer. In this show, I will interview filmmakers in all facets of production and distribution. I'm so excited to have the very talented editors from HBO's The Last of Us, Emily Mendez and Timothy Good. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having yeah. us. Yeah. So you both worked together on several TV series, uh, The Resident, The Umbrella Academy, and now The Last of Us. Um, Emily, can you tell us how you got started in editing and first met Timothy? Yeah, so I am originally from Texas. I moved out to Los Angeles to study editing at the American Film Institute. And after that, I moved into behind the scenes editing. I've always been interested in editing since I was very young. So uh, it was kind of on my mind that I wanted to get into television. Television was always like one of the things that I loved. Um, and then I was lucky enough to get an offer with the help of a uh, professor I had at AFI, uh, Farrell Levy, and um, I got into TV, and I started working on a Fox show called Rosewood with a different editor, Nicole Vascal. Nicole kind of gave me that chance of entering into TV without experience because she had also done, been working in behind-the-scenes stuff. We both loved Spotify. We both loved putting together playlists. There were a lot of things we connected with during our interview, and so, yeah, we just started working together, and then after Rosewood, she took me to a show called The Resident, and uh, one of the other editors on The Resident was Tim. So Tim and I uh, started, We so that was around, what, 2018? 20, 2017, Tim? I think, yeah. Like 2017, yeah, I think so. yeah, so we, we've known each other since then. And then around season three of The Resident, Nicole uh, had to leave to go to a different show, and I was still really happy at The Resident, and it just didn't work for me to move. And then at the same time, Tim was losing his assistant, Amanda, who we love, she was moving on to edit on the Umbrella Academy. And so we sort of paired up in that moment. Tim was like, do you want to come work for me? And I was like, yes. So that that was how Tim and I started working together. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then, Tim, you've worked on, you've been working for a long time. What was your road to editing? Uh, I'm aged, <laughs> yes. Uh, and my road to editing was, I similar to Emily, I loved ed editing from an early age, which is so odd. You would say, why? Well, why? Uh, my pathway came through being obsessed with architecture and music and sort of those two things and being a nerd uh, and being an outsider because as a nerdy outsider, like one just observes and looks at people and susses everyone out. Um, and so that was something that I loved doing. And uh, I immediately in high school started editing. Uh, they had a TV studio in, in my local high school. And I gravitated towards it. I loved creating things that felt very musical. Um, and I went to school for a film at Northwestern and found myself just, again, just gravitating towards editorial. So when I moved to Los Angeles, I said, well, I have to do this. Um, and I was lucky enough to find a amazing, an amazing mentor, Norman Buckley, who was an editor who's now a director. And he just he was rigorous, but he was kind. And he taught me a craft that I did not have. And I, I had instincts, I had, you know, good ideas, but I had no way to express them. Um, and he really helped, uh, shape that sort of craft for me. And uh, he helped me get, uh, a show called, uh, the OC. Um, and that was one of my first shows as an editor, and it was an amazing experience to work with Josh Schwartz and Stephanie Savage. And then they said, we would like you to do our next show, uh, the pilot called Gossip Girl. And I said, whoa, wow, well, what's this? Um, and that's how everything started for me. Wow. And I was I was just kind of curious, like uh, transitioning from show to show, how does that work? What drives you to transition to the next show? And we can take the last three shows, like The Resident, The Umbrella Academy, and now The Last of Us. Um, I was also just kind of curious, like, um, can you work on two shows? Like, is there a timing for one show and then you could do that and then jump onto another show and then back to that show? Or do you have to actually leave shows to go to the next show? Ooh, that's a good question. It's a tough one. Um, I would say in terms of well, how do you get the next show? I found that it always was based on relationships and the people you had been working with. Um, and where they were going, because usually when a show would end, everyone would sort of split off um, and go separate ways. And then sometimes one of them would say, hey, I'm going to do this thing and they need an editor. And, you know, I, I told them about you. 
Um, so I feel like everything for me has stemmed from from that experience. Every, every single job I've gotten has been based on some sort of thread from a previous job. So the journey starts from the first job you take. Um, it really it really does. It's it all has a genesis and, and, a, and a through line. Um, in terms of like working on multiple shows, it's I think it's pretty impossible to do that. I've done a little bit of overlapping. In in uh, in fact, recently we did that uh, just so we could do. The Last of Us and uh, the Umbrella Academy and the Resident. We I would overlap by a couple weeks, um, and that was really difficult. Uh, not the best idea because uh, you kind of have to divide um, a full day into two shows, and you have to give them a full day. So you somehow make it work. You accelerate your brain. You work extra long, um, but it's because you care so much about the projects uh, equally, and you want to give them uh, the best uh, strip that you can. So, well, and it also talks about the working relationships because I know Emily, you also resident the Umbrella Academy, and then The Last of Us. So, were you going with Tim to the next shows? That's how you were brought on. Yeah, once Tim and I started working together, we just stuck together because it was just it was we were doing so well together as a team, and so he would just be like, "You want to come with me to Umbrella Academy? You want to come with me to Last of Us?" And every time I was like, "Yes, please take me with you," and because he's the best and I love him, and so yeah, that that was how I moved to those it shows. Was an easy, easy ask. Just says a lot for what you were just saying at the beginning is it's about relationship because you know when you're editing, you know you're really in the intimacy of a story, you know, um, and telling the story and working with somebody that you really mesh well with of course you're going to want to take them on or or not you know if the relationship isn't that great you're going to want to move on with somebody else but I just think that's just so cool the opportunities that you get when you have a mentor yeah it's pretty great and I and again I, I as someone who was mentored it's like my goal in life to pay that back tenfold um, and I just I love doing it I teach at UCLA as well I teach directors uh, about editing because I find that if directors don't understand uh, the intimacy of the editorial process and and how to get what you're looking for, um, then they can sometimes not do their best work. So it's 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 my hope to shine a light on all things editorial. How about that? Yeah. How how do you do all that? I mean, uh, how do you teach and edit? Uh, I don't have children. Okay. So is it just scheduling? Like, are you teaching at night or something? I mean, yeah, I'm always kind of curious. Yeah, I would teach curious. at night and on, and on weekends. Yeah, they, they were kind enough to allow me to teach on Saturday mornings. And uh -huh. so I would, okay. I would do a Saturday morning. And even if I had to work a weekend, I would still do the Saturday morning and then head over to the office. Uh, and oh, do I a, got it. A full day. But it was, I mean, I find teaching to be an enormously gratifying experience. Um, it's very fulfilling to see other people learn um, and to have light bulbs go uh, off in their head and, you know, for as uh, ancient as I am, it does keep me a little bit younger. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I, I should have said a seasoned editor. I didn't mean anything about ageism. Oh, I'm, I was I'm like, having fun with it. <laughs> Trust me, I'm yeah. having fun with it. I mean, hey, you got the maturity. I exactly. Mean, you know, people forget about that. That's you know? right. Um, so I, I was also curious, like, you know, when you come onto a show and you are the first editor starting this new series, right? Um, do you have like a template that they're saying, okay, this is the flow of the show and you need to edit? Or do you have creative uh, range to say, okay, I'm going to come in and I'm going to give my spin on this? Or do you kind of have like a, you know, like, I mean, Resident might be different from The Last of Us because The Last of Us came from a video game. So. Right. Well, I could talk Any about the, I could, I could talk about the Resident actually, um, because I was the, the uh, they did a pilot that I, I was not involved in because um, I couldn't. And, uh, and then I came in and I started the first episode of the, of, uh, the show. And as someone who's done pilots and first episodes of series, it's a slightly different beast. The pilot usually gives you a really good roadmap as an editor who's starting a series. Uh, the pilot will give you a sense of uh, the characters, the journey, um, and the general style of editorial. Um, and if you're doing a pilot, so I've done several, uh, pilots as well. I think of it as a massive collaboration with, first of all, I think about the script and what the script is trying to say. Um, because ultimately if they're, if the script is good and usually the scripts, you know, hopefully I'm doing are, are really great and I'm really happy with them. Um, and I've said, yes, yay, because they're great. 
um, they have something that they want to say, and usually it's based uh, in some some way on character. Um, and so I just sort of try and delve into the character, into the script. And then I love to have uh, meetings with the director in advance before the filming starts and say, what is the plan? What? Uh, how is the style going to be? You know, are there any things you want to point me towards? Any inspirations? Uh, any? And I always say, the, uh, I always ask, is there any music that you think is similar to the style that you're going for? Because that will inform me in terms of uh, what you're thinking about in terms of score. Um, and that is always very helpful because music being the ultimate tonal shift, um, you can really create tone with music. Um, and if they say, oh, I want Born Identity, I go, oh, all right, different kind of show um, versus something that's uh, a little bit more, um, I don't know, uh, David, uh, 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 David Newman or something like that. You go, oh, okay, all right, that's very different. Um, but I, I think it's a lot about uh, listening to your collaborators. And then I usually will present something that, again, I feel is in the spirit of the collaboration, but I also don't shy away from having some kind of a overarching feeling that I did this. Um, and usually for me, that means nuance and character. Um, I try and just dig nuance and character uh, and create a, a really strong, very fluid story. Oh, I love it. Yeah, and I didn't even think about the music because that would yeah. really set the tone. Yeah, of it really the does. Flow. <laughs> yeah, no, it really, it really, it allows you to understand what. Oh, as you go, oh, this is like Guy Ritchie. It's not like you know, <laughs> it's very different from what you're we're looking for. Um, and then you know, again, I, I, a very interesting story about the Gossip Girl pilot is we originally scored that uh, pilot with independent underground New York indie bands, and when the the network saw it they said this is not what we asked for at all and we had created this really interesting sort of palette uh musically and they said no 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 we 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 need fergie we need no you know gwen stefani we need all this and over a 24 hour period we completely uh uh rescored the entire pilot turned it in like within 24 hours they're like and you're picked up uh because it oh, was a wow. complete tonal shift so ah uh. Yeah, I guess that can make or break it, like you're saying. It sure can. Yeah, they were just like, this is not what we were thinking. This, this belongs on HBO. And we were like, yeah, exactly. And they're like, no, not not us. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so, Emily, um, so you came to The the Last of Us as an assistant editor and then moved a uh, transition to editor. So I just want to say congratulations. That must feel really great. Thank you. And then can you tell yeah. us the process? Yeah, sure. So Tim and I, since we started working together, he would always let me cut scenes when when I could. So I would cut scenes for him. We would talk. And going back to him being a teacher and a mentor, like he has taught me so much. And my approach to editing has shifted in a way since being with him, because I find that the way that he approaches editing is just it, it's just opened my eyes to a lot of things. And so I've adapted a lot of Tim's method uh, for editing. And so, you know, when we were on Resident Season 3, I co-edited a couple episodes with him. I, and then on Umbrella Academy, when we were working together, I didn't get a chance to co-edit, but I was still, you know, editing if I could little, little scenes for him. Um, but uh, once we got to Last of Us at that point, he knew that, you know, I was able to cut, essentially. So by the time we started Last of Us, um, the we started on Episode 3. And so I was assisting, but I still I was able to cut like the the, the concluding uh, scene with Joel and Ellie in the car when he's like seatbelt and then they drive off. Like I was really lucky enough to be able to cut that scene, which was so fun. And um, at the same time, I was working along with uh, Craig, Craig Mason, our showrunner, who we love, and he loves sound. And so I was already working on sound, doing a lot of sound, which is normal as an assistant. But I was I was working pretty closely with Craig as we were working on episode three. We were working on the pilot episode, getting the temp sound kind of in a good place uh, as Craig wanted. Kind of a, a little bit into half into the season yeah, or so. Yeah, a couple, couple months right, in. Tim, we, we were, yeah, we were getting, uh, we were getting closer to the left behind episode uh which is ellie and riley's episode um coming up and we had a lot on our plate and uh tim thought that he could use the extra help and so he asked craig if i could co-edit with him and 
Craig was nice enough to say that I could. And so that was my first episode that I co-edited with Tim. And it was a very, very special episode to me. It was always my favorite part of the game, the left behind portion. Um, it resonates a lot with me. Um, and so that was the first episode that I started co-editing on. And then it went really well. And then we just kept co-editing other episodes together. And that was kind of how that all started. And it was, I feel very lucky that it happened because... Tim and I, we work very well together. We're like a team. It's like going to work and working with your best friend, like just being able to talk openly and like learn all the time, which I'm always happiest when I'm learning. And Tim loves to teach. And so like we'll just watch scenes together and talk. And it, it's a very, you know, I think that sometimes like getting notes on scenes can be very vulnerable. But with Tim, it's not like there's nothing doesn't feel like anything personal at all. It's always just like, how can we make this better? How can this grow? Like, how are we? you know, supporting the story. There's all, it's always just something that's like helping us get the story in a better place. And so it's a really fun collaboration uh, when we work together oh. as a team. You so. know, it, it, oh, go ahead, Tim. Oh, she, I was say? just going to say she's completely downplaying her amazing skill as a sound designer. And she's also completely downplaying the fact that Craig Mason was like ecstatic with what she did. Um, and that when, you know, Craig was just saying, I need you guys to kind of do everything. From here on out, that's when we were uh, co-editing together, and it is uh, great for me also because I get to learn from Emily. And if you stop learning, uh, then you die. And so I, I learn so much from her, and I rely on on her uh, story sense, her emotional sense, her character sense uh, to help make these shows the best they can. And and ultimately, it is a a, a great way of working, and I love uh, every minute. Uh, of this uh, season together because we really truly uh, took uh, an almost impossible task yeah. and, and made it look yeah. easy. I, I'm loving the flow of the differences in the episodes, especially the one with Bill and Frank. I mean, the episode Long, Long Time, so different from yeah. all the others. And and it was kind of sad, too. And I think that's probably what people had said is like, well, we wanted to see them more. We wanted to like like get to know them versus one episode. But I mean, what a loving relationship. It was just like so heartfelt and just the end was sad. But yet I could see that being the end. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't leave. I would be like, you're dying. I'm dying. There's no way I'm going on without you. <laughs> exactly. So. No, and that was the that was the joy of, of their successful life. Yes. Uh, yeah. And then the, the girls, oh, at the um, mall. I mean, how cool was that? Just like and so sad, too. I mean, yeah. That's like that's Just kind of guess. our thing. Cool but sad. So yeah, yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> um, I'm. I was kind of curious. Like, um, do you feel like it's easier to get notes from fellow editors versus a director or producers? Like, because you feel like the editor, they get it, you know, in a different way than maybe producers would. In Ooh. the in branches of editing. <laughs> that's a that's a really good question, and I will. I have two answers to that. One is. Yes, and one is no. Um, and uh, it makes uh, right now it makes no sense. But here's the thing. Editors know how the bodies are put together. And so I love getting notes from editors because of that. But I also don't like getting notes from editors because they know exactly how the bodies are, are built. Sometimes you need to break the body. Um, and a producer will give will ask you something that's not possible. But then you have to think about how to make it possible. So sometimes I prefer a note from a producer or a director who's trying to get something that wasn't filmed or is not easily identifiable editorially. Um, so it's sort of this double-edged thing where it's like, I love getting notes from editors because they do know how to uh, how these things work and they can be very efficient and also very kind. Um, whereas a producer and director may be just like, I want this to be this. And you go, oh, that's not what's there. Um, but I got to make that work somehow. And so uh, I think the challenge is something that I prefer. Um, I like to see how to break something and rebuild it. Um, so yeah, it's a, how do you, what do you think, Emily? What, what's your, what's your instinct? I was going to, I, I agree with what you're saying, but also sometimes you get producers that just understand editing. Like yeah. Craig Mazin totally understands yeah. editing because he loves puzzles. Tim and I love puzzles and Craig just understands how editing works. So his notes just are fantastic editorially and we love working with him. And so like sometimes we'll get a producer like him who just gets it. And so it's just his notes are awesome. I, I mean, I think, yeah, I love I love working with him. No, it's a it's a joy because he again, he 
He says, I, I try and encode puzzle pieces and I give all those puzzle pieces to the, the editors. And then the, I'm hoping that the editors can then put the puzzle back together the way I think it, it, it the way I think it should go. And if it's not, I, I can, I at least know what the puzzle pieces are so I can help them uh, figure it out. And he's excellent and exquisite at uh, uh, giving notes because he also understands that it is a process and that he has to uh, uh, rely on our artistry to make sure that, you know, he's protected in terms of editing style and, you know, we're not going to make anything embarrassing for him um, uh, yeah. ever. I, that's the thing. I'm always like, I, I always am in super um, protective mode with all of my uh, writer, showrunners and producers and directors um, as I just, I, I don't want anything to go out that's embarrassing. Um, ever so uh, it's great it's great working with people like that um, it's yeah that's the way to do it in the end yeah and I agree with what you were saying about like sometimes from a different lens um, it'll push your boundaries push yeah. you out of your own comfort zone that maybe somebody else might just like okay we've got this we'll make it work let's just massage it versus wait a minute I've got to do something totally outside the box and yep. now I gotta figure it out um, I love that. So how do you work with uh, your team, like your directors and producers that come in and give you notes? I mean, how does that work? Do you have to um, edit a couple versions and then you send it up? Do they come in? Are you in the studio at home? Like, how does that work for when do you get notes? Emily, why don't you start? Um, so once we put our editors cut together, it normally goes to the director. And so we'll work with the director and every show has been different, like the amount of time we have with the director. But it's normally just us working with them, whether they're coming into the office, if we have that set up, whether we were working remote, which we did a lot on like Umbrella Academy. We were remote for a while. Like different, It's been different for some things. Um, and then once we get the director's cut, that's when we send it to, to the producers. And then we're like in producer's cut, getting that going, doing the notes. Um on Last of Us, we worked in person with Craig a lot. We we work. We tend to. He likes to work in person. I I think it's a great thing to be able to work in person because you can just like go off of each other in the room and and do notes. So we would we would work that way, uh, at least for the yeah, Last and of Us. The the thing is about uh, there. I generally only work with one version of anything, um, uh, as opposed to here's three versions of the show. Uh, I would say no. I, I generally have an idea of what I think it should be. And I say, I'm going to stick with that. And then if the director wants to adjust that, they can. Um, and they do. And and they improve it. And it's and it's always lovely to get that improvement. And then you send that one version off to the producer. And then the producer uh, works on hopefully that one version. But then there are times where multiple versions of a scene may have to be created. Specifically on Last of Us, we had an option at the very end of the season for two different ways to end. And we were like, ooh, hmm, which version should we do? So we made two different versions and we sent them to the uh, all, multiple different uh, producers to see which version they preferred. Um, and they were multiple like, oh, I don't like this one. I like that one. I like this one. I don't like that one. And you go, OK, then a discussion happens. But it's generally based on a scene and a, a, or a specific area versus an entire way of doing it. A, because you just don't have time, um, especially in television. There's just no time. Um, you got to work on uh, uh, instinctual filmmaking, as I call it. Um, you just got to you got to get there. Um, but yeah, that's that's generally how you would uh, you would function. And and you know, for us, having uh, m multiple weeks with directors was really helpful. Uh, normally, directors only get like four days uh, on a network show or on a streaming show, and they were kind enough to allow the directors to really have a, like a week or two um, to sort of hone their vision of of the material because they had twenty day shoots. And 20 days is a, is a luxury in television. Um, and it was a, a blessing for us because the, the quality of the material was so high. Um, and, and we just really were uh, lucky to have such, you know, again, great casting, great performances, whatnot. Um, and so having that time with the director really allows the episodes to, be, uh, to get into a much better shape in preparation for working with Craig. Yeah. Um, so, okay, let's dive into the first cut. Yay. I just was wondering what your each of your processes into diving into the first cut of the show. Do you um, read the script? Do you make notes? Do you like spend a day watching all the footage? Do you all watch it together? And how, how do you work? Go ahead, Emily. Yeah, so Tim and I work similar, um, but 
Well, we read the script generally before we get the dailies. Um, sometimes we'll make, I'll make, I'll sometimes make notes. Do you make notes normally, Tim, when you read yeah, the script? Yeah, I do. Make, I, I, I'll, I'll read it once for impact just so I can feel it. And then I'll read yeah. it a second time to see where all the clues are. And then I'll yeah. mark them. So, uh, and then well, as we start getting dailies in, we will watch the dailies by ourselves and I throw down markers. We we have like a whole thing, but we mark, we have different color markers for different things. Um, we have things that designate the different cameras. Uh, we also, and so we'll be marking things like, I don't know, like this, this was, this is helping the story. I like this moment where she made this face because, oh, maybe it's her thinking this thing or, um, we have a marker for specific sound ups. Like if if they say something maybe that wasn't scripted, that's interesting. Like um, for instance, when Ellie finds the diva cup and says gross, like that was something that she said, I think one time and I had seen in the dailies and I marked it. And then we eventually added that in there. So just things like that we're marking. But then our favorite marker is the magenta marker. And we put that when it's something that we think is like, this has to go in the cut. This is This is gold. And a lot of that comes from just like, what is our initial reaction? Like one of my magenta markers for The Last of Us was this shot of the of when baby Ellie, when Ellie is born and there's this little shot of her feet and it's like next to the, the green jacket. And so that was a magenta marker that I had and that's in the cut. Um, but it, it's just like things that make us feel something where maybe the camera was moving perfectly and everything from acting to the lighting, everything is working. It, it, it can range, but... Magenta markers are are typically our favorite, and we we always get excited and tell each other like that was a magenta marker. And um, so, anyways, we're marking up all the dailies, and that's really helpful. We watch everything. Tim talks about it like you're prepping your ingredients for a recipe. Um, it, it's just like so we know what we have, and we can do the footage the best. The, we can do the best justice for the footage. So, um, once we watch all that, then we just start putting it together. And I think that having all those markers is super helpful. If I find myself getting stuck, I'll go back and I'll look at like, what did I mark? What was I feeling when I first was watching the dailies, when I first was reacting to the footage? And it's our it's our way of reminding ourselves like what our initial reaction was when we first saw everything. So that's kind of the dailies process. Yeah, for, and, and, for me, and I'll just add a little bit to that, which is I think of uh, uh, dailies as a heat map. I don't know where I got this from. Maybe I was watching Predator one night. Um, but it's like, uh, there's certain parts of the dailies that get hotter and certain parts that get cooler. And where, when it becomes hotter, I go, Ooh, this is like, it's, it's really saying I need to be in the, the movie. I, I, I want to be in. Um, and so I go, Ooh, this is much, this has more heat to it. Um, and then over time, the heat map changes because then certain things are like, well, we want this scene to be more like this. And I go, Oh, so all of my initial things that I thought were the, the good parts of the dailies are actually not the right parts. And so I'll watch it again and see, Oh, what they're looking for is different now. And different portions of the dailies are now the, the, the hotter portions. I know it's a weird way of thinking about it, but it's just how my brain works. It's a, it's a, it's a strange, you know, internal beast inside there, I guess. No, no, I, I love everybody's process. It's all different and you can learn and grow from what other people do. Yeah, and sometimes people will edit um, sort of, they'll, they'll sort of throw things together quickly and, 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 and do that. I don't do that. Um, I'm very intentional when I start. Um, I start from the beginning of a scene and I move my way through it. Some people throw like, oh, I have to throw in all the beats here and there that I'll work my way to them. Um, I, don't, I don't do that. Um, it's not that it's a better method or a worse method. It's just my method. Um, as I, I'm very linear in that, in that respect. Um, and then I'll, and then I'll go back through it and watch it again and go, Oh, I got to change some stuff in here. This, 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 this is a, this isn't working for this reason. La 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 la. Ah, I get it. Um, so did you have to keep the original video game tone or were you allowed to kind of I haven't seen the video game. Did you guys both play the video game before you started or just kind of went in just with the flow of the script? Um, the video game was one of my favorite games I had ever played. I had played it a couple years before we started working on the show, though. So it wasn't super fresh to me, but I knew the characters, I knew the storyline, and I loved them. As far as tone goes, we were following what Craig had in the script. Like that was kind of where our basis for the tone for when we were working on the dailies and what we were getting for the dailies when we, you know, were watching them. 
I think it just so happened that it, it still was going a, similar along the lines of the game because, you know, Craig was working close with, with Neil to make sure that it was reflecting, you know, what they wanted it to do. Um, but Tim, do you, you want to talk about? Yeah, Tim? sure. Yeah. I mean, I infamously at this point have never played the game, nor have have I still, and nor do I intend to. Um, because I, I weirdly, A, because we were hired late and I didn't have time. So that was the practical reason why I couldn't do it. And B, because I said to myself, what if I just don't play so I can approach everything with zero preconceptions? Um, I'm not going to see anything and go, oh, I have to make that in, into the show because that's from the game. If I, if I know nothing about the game, then I'm going to create something that hopefully will be um, a guardian for the people who haven't played the game. I can be like sort of the, the shepherd of those folks who haven't played so I can make sure the story is working from just a general standpoint. Um, and, you know, Craig Mason's scripts are so great anyway, um, but every piece of dailies that came in, I was approaching completely fresh. Um, and I felt that that, and, and Emily would then, like, you know, point me, oh, look what you did there. And I'm like, what did I do? And she's like, y you did something like the game, but you, you came to it naturally. Um, and so uh, in, in the pilot, for example, there's a sequence um, where uh, Ellie and Joel are, are yelling at each other because they're arguing because he's like, I'm going to sleep. And she's like, well, what the hell am I supposed to do? Um, and I remember putting that scene together. I'm like, oh, this is really great because they're just talking over each other and they're, and they're being, you know, how people normally argue, which is they don't pause or anything like that. And then I, someone said, well, you really should look at this, the scene from the game because it's totally different. I go, oh, is it? And I looked back at the scene from the game at that point, and every and and after every line, they paused for like two seconds, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Like I may have thought this was how the cadence and the pace of the series should go, and I may have cut it in a totally different manner had I known that. Um, and so, even subconsciously, I, I felt like if I knew these things, I might have a preconceived notion. Um, so going into it, I, I felt it was a really interesting uh, risk to take. It was scary, um, but I had Emily. And so I thought, you know what? This is going to work because she knows everything about the game. I don't know anything about the game. Craig knows everything about the game and more. So it's it's going to work. And, and in the end, uh, the thing I love uh, hearing most is that, oh, I love the game, but my wife didn't know anything about it. And she loved it. I'm like, then we did it. Yes. Were there always gay themes in it, in the game? Oh, yeah. Oh, that is so yep. cool. Absolutely. I mean, so cool for the times. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. It was, it was very, very, uh, uh, a very gay game. And, and you know, Bill, the, the, the character of Bill, and, and Emily, you'll probably know more about this, but I believe it was only hinted at in the game that Bill was gay. Is that right, Emily? Yes, I, I think yeah. you're right. It was, yeah. like a, it, was a, it was just a hint. It was like I had a partner, and the partner, you know, killed himself. And it was a very different story, actually. Um, yeah, but... The Ellie and Riley thing was very yeah. similar, like, and they kissed in the game, and that was why that portion of the game was my favorite, because I was playing it, I was like, are they really a thing? They're, are they going to be a thing? And then I was like, oh, they are a thing, and it was just the first time I'd played a game where I was, like, watching, you know, someone that was like me, you know, and I was like, this is so cool. Um, that was so special yeah. when I played that. Yeah, it makes me want to watch the game, or play the game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And then uh, were there any specific scenes or sequences that required extensive editing to uh, enhance the emotional impact or build tension? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that real briefly. Sometimes tension is created by not editing. Um, and I find that that's helpful. Uh, anytime you make an edit, you sort of relieve tension because you're shifting the perspective and you're not forcing the audience to be in one specific frame. Um, so for example, in the, uh, in the Bill and Frank episode, when they have their first lunch and they're sitting down together, it's very tentative and there's a lot of long shots between the two of them. And I tried not to edit specifically because I wanted the audience to have to endure, um, endure and survive. Uh, they had to endure, uh, being with these characters and their own awkwardness. So I think tension can be created by not editing or actually sometimes editing a little bit later than when the audience might expect it because then they go, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm here. And then they get to see the next thing and then that lasts a little bit too long. Um, it's always based on the energy of the characters and the energy of the story, of course. But sometimes I think tension uh, is added when you try not to make edits. Um, but in, in terms of uh, using editorial to sort of enhance um, 
Oh gosh. Like, I mean, it's a tricky question actually, because I think everything we do is, is in, is edi editorially is enhancing things, but we do it from always one perspective. And the perspective is a relationship perspective. We think of it as everything is relationship editing, even in action sequences. I, I call it character-based action because it was always about the characters and how they were uh, looking out for one another in the ma the major battle sequence in episode five, for example, uh, that whole sequence, which was shot over like three weeks, um, ultimately became a two person scene with a thousand extras because it was really about Joel protecting Ellie and Ellie trying to get out of the situation that she was in. And, and it was about that dyad it was about keeping that dyad together at all times. And anything that uh, veered outside of that story was about enhancing the threat to Ellie's character. Uh, or the threat to uh, sort of the entire battle sequence. Um, so there was not a lot of extraneous material. Um, we would never just add something just to add it or just, oh, that's a cool shot. We should put that in. It was like, no, what does this mean for the story and for the characters? And if it doesn't have any meaning for story or character, it's not going in. So I always, I laugh. It's like it took three weeks and in the end, it's like three minutes um, because it was really just a simple scene um, with, uh, with all that. Emily, do you have anything uh, other that you want to discuss about that? Um, no, I think you're right. I, we, we always are talking about, uh, connection. And, and when you're, when you're talking about that, that was making me think of connection. Like we're wanting to feel connected to the characters. And I think that that battle sequence, what I love about it is you feel so connected to Joel and to Ellie and, and that's what you're seeing. And that's why you feel so scared when you're watching it. So I, I do think that's very successful in that yeah. way. Okay. This, it's shot in green screen. Some of this, right? Yeah, some of it, not it's all. Of show. It. So, do you have to work with how? How do you work with green screen? I mean, do they superimpose the world in there? So, when you're editing, you get to see it, or are you working in green screen when you're trying to cut a scene? Here, here's the thing, and I'll, and I'll just say this about the way that they designed the production, which I thought was absolutely stunningly brilliant, is that. Green screen was never there as like the entire environment. They would always build as much of the environment as they possibly could in the art department. Um, and the production designers, they, they would build huge sets. And then, you know, at the, at the top of the set, they would say, all right, now the rest of it, visual effects will take over. So a majority of this is going to feel practical. A, and, and, you know, Craig has spoken about this, that he wants the actors to feel like they're in a real space. So that they're reacting to things as opposed to to a you know being in a volume of just green and trying to have any kind of connection, uh, and it's one of the reasons what they where they actually had Ellie interact with a real giraffe as opposed to a fake giraffe, as they said, you know Ellie has to really have a uh, a, a moment with a real giraffe. Uh, that real giraffe has it has to be spontaneous, otherwise it's just not going to feel emotionally correct. Um, and so all of those things that happen in the giraffe sequence and the closer shots are because it's a real giraffe doing unpredictable things. And, and the uh, uh, Ellie, uh, Bella Ramsey, is reacting naturally. And, and it was just a beautiful thing to see. So when we work with, the, with green screen material, I generally don't think about anything except for what's happening in the, the, the sort of the relationship sector, uh, what's happening in terms of the eye lines of the characters and what I'm trying to build connectively. And then we will talk to our fabulous visual effects team uh, led by Alex Wong and then his visual effects editor, Luke Poterin, and they will help us fill in those green screens temporarily to help sell the world. Um, and they'll say, OK, well, we have we already have some stuff that we can throw in there and we'll do you know all the technical stuff to help you guys once you feel that the cut is in a, a place where you're happy with it. And so they would stay. Uh, uh, late nights to do this and they were really, really helpful to us because they really wanted to make sure that um, th the directors and the producers had a really great representation of what the green screens were going to potentially look like. And and so that's uh, how we were lucky enough to get to work with them because it was just way easier when they've done a majority of, of uh, like for example, Bill and Frank's house, it was all built, but then outside the windows it was green. Because they were like, well, it's on a stage, so there's nothing we can do here. Um, we're not going to try and, and fake this. Because they also wanted the outside windows to have a life. So they would they went to the location and they shot all the plates for that, as opposed to sometimes in sitcoms they'll use something called a translate, where it's just something that's out there that's sort of a dead dead image. 
Uh, it doesn't have any life to it. Um, but they would actually say, well, we're going to, we're going to fill these in with, you know, images of life. Uh, we just, uh, we, we just can't do that right now. Uh huh. Um, and Emily, I wanted to kind of go back to music design and, uh, do you have like a music library that you get to access and then talk me through how you approach putting in music and then do they ever keep that music that you chose? Um, well, for this show, we were lucky that we had the um, the same composer from the game, Gustavo. Um, and so we were able to use all the video game score in our temping of music. And sometimes the songs that we had in certain places, they stayed. Sometimes Gustavo and his team would uh, rescore things. Um, but it, it changes per show. For this show, the the music element of it is so specific to the game. It, it's really iconic. The it's very um, it's just very special to the characters. And and I think I think also to people that played the game, like it's so Last of Us, like the way that it sounds. So Tim and I used mostly the video game score as we were scoring things. Um, and so I felt that we were very lucky in that regard. Um, the one thing that we did do is we were not specific about like, oh, the game used this score in this specific scene, so we have to use this song in this specific scene. Like we we didn't do that. We were like, we listened to the we would listen to the score and we'd be like, what feels like it is matching us emotionally where we are in the scene and and what is fitting in the best way. So so we did kind of allow ourselves to use pieces that maybe were in a different spot in the game, but just felt like they fit you know, in a, a better place in the show. Um, so I think that was one thing we did that was kind of cool to use. But yeah, no, we were temping that stuff in from the yeah, beginning. Yeah, again, the music was an ultimate tonal sort of North Star. It was our compass in terms of making, uh, uh, sort of dialing in on the, on what the tone is uh, of the show. And I can give you a, an example of when we completely deviated. Uh, in Bill and Frank's final embrace before they go off to die, I'm, I'm using the music from the giraffe um, <laughs> in the game. Um, and it just it just spoke to me so much how it was uh, how it was so gentle and vulnerable and had such a, a beautiful sensitive build, and I didn't know it of course because I hadn't played the game, um, and so they left it because they're like well, that's great I'm like and then they, uh, I later on I'm like that's the that's the giraffe music and they're like yeah yeah that's yeah, fine, so <laughs> it works well, you know music is I think music enhances uh, you know. Uh, the film or television series or whatever, uh, the flow and the emotion of the scene. And and also music can break it, too, if it's the wrong choice. So um, it's always great when you are just in something and you're just watching it, uh, like Bill and Frank's story. I mean, I was just in it from beginning to end and so sad at the end. Uh, but yeah, and, and I just love when that works and you just, I mean, I just felt the love and that's what you really want is you want somebody when they're watching it to just like, I mean, I was crying. I was crying at the end. I was crying throughout really. Well, you weren't the uh, only one. So that's the good news. Craig Mazin famously was crying so hard it hurt him. So. Yeah. Now, do you guys watch HBO live your show? Do you watch your show afterwards? <sighs> Yeah. With family? Uh, yes. Not uh, yeah, live, I, I don't think. Um, sometimes I just need to uh, <laughs> dissociate for a moment. But then I will look at it because I, I also like to see how something translates to a streaming platform. Um, we have a very specific idea of how it sounds and looks in, on the, uh, the mixing stage. And so I like to see how that translates. And so in the future, I go, oh, you know what? That music was still too low. And because uh, uh, it, 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 it always is different. You cannot do one to one. It, it's just impossible. It will never sound as good as it does on a mix stage when you're sitting on a in a, basically in a movie theater uh, and hearing exactly a 5.1 version of, of your of your sh television show. Um, and you're sitting in the exact right seat and they have like, you know, hundred thousand dollar speakers all around you. And uh, so it'll never be perfect. But you always try and sort of see how it does translate. And then my other thing I love about watching things on, on HBO is that a lot of times when you're watching things on an, uh, a computer, an Avid or editing system, you go, oh, I got to stop and make a change. But when you're watching it on, on HBO, you, you don't have that choice. It's done. And so you actually have to watch it and, and see if it actually flows and, yeah. and, and, and feel like the flow of it. And, and, and then you can sort of judge yourself. 
um, which is always scary. Uh, and I just go, oh man, I could have added two frames there. So. All <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, I was thinking, do we take the editor glasses off when we're watching things or we're like, oh, that cut didn't work. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, why didn't I hold yeah. on that? Where is this, you know, reverse yeah, that's shot a, here? I, I always <laughs> say I've, I've been ruined. Uh, I just. I, yeah, it's yeah, really hard. I, I write off my uh, my all of my uh, streaming bills because it's like it, this is work all the time. So sorry to yeah. say. Well, and other people's shows for that matter. I oh, mean, yeah. I'm sure that you're watching others and just Absolutely. going, oh, I'm going, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Usually. So. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yep. mean, there's a lot of good shows out there that I am so riveted, like Succession. My God. Oh, my God, was... yeah. Incredible. <laughs> the acting, the story. Yeah. It was phenomenal, and the ending was great. Well, you know, I, I, I liked it. I thought, wow, what a sl slap in the face. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you watched the I, ending. I of... watched the ending, of course. I, I'm obsessed with it. I loved it. So Yeah. And, Emily, do you watch your shows? You, I think you had said, yes, you do. Yeah, yeah, no, I will watch them. There, it's there's something special about watching it at home, you know. Like, I like to watch it, like watch the episodes yeah. with my wife and like hear her response. And like, uh, for Left Behind, actually, we had a little party at my house, and Tim came, and my family and closest friends were here. And so just to hear their reactions, and like, there's just something really cool about that. It's like the final like act of like seeing it in your home with your family. I, and I love something it. else happened that night. I think it's if fun. you remember is that something we didn't uh, uh, anticipate, which was once all of your friends and family saw and left behind that the, the infected was in the mall, they were scared for the entire rest of the episode. And I was like, wow. Yeah. I said, I didn't anticipate this. Um, this is really cool to, to see them like literally like, uh, it's, it's coming in this scene. It's coming in this scene. Um, and it was just really neat to yeah, see how- Yeah, it was interesting. How because we knew when it was coming, so we were like, "Oh, you got, you got a while," um, but we didn't want to say anything. But we just, I just loved watching everyone's like sort of tense up at moments where they thought that it was coming back, and and it just reminded you that uh, you know the placement of where you put these things has an enormous impact on how an audience will uh, sort of carry through uh, the rest of uh, of the show. Yeah, I I agree. I when I was watching it too, I was thinking the same thing, like. Oh God, she's gonna die. She's gonna die. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, and and every scene was like, and and it was the suspense. It was like, not this scene, not this scene. Okay, it's this one. It's got to be. And then nope. So yeah, well it was cool. Done. It was cool. Bravo, bravo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do, have you ever had like where there were any deleted or altered scenes that you felt particularly attached to, but had to sacrifice for the sake of the story? Mm -hmm. That you're like, dang, I wanted that in there. I don't think so. Um, Not really on this show. I don't yeah. think so either. Craig is Craig is really efficient with his writing. It's really, it's all muscle, you know, and bone. It's never any additional stuff. It's not like, oh, I need to like fluff this area out. No, it's like every piece has a value to it. I think sometimes what we ended up doing is deleting uh, sometimes portions of scenes and scenes where we recognize that being too literal was unnecessary. I'll give you an example. In the Bill and Frank episode, there was a scene where they were supposed to go down into the bunker to get all of the materials so they could pack up the truck. And Bill had said in the letter, you know, make sure you enter the right code in or else you're going to blow up. And so they had a scene where they went in to the, where the bunker code was and they kind of had this tentative moment where he enters in the, the bunker code and, and they look at each other like, are we going to blow up? And, and then they don't, and then they go down. And, and, and Craig was just like, you know, as much as I thought I needed that, and because I wanted to be like really literal and, and realistic to what their experience was, now that I've seen the Bill and Frank story, I feel this is, this is absolutely unnecessary because it's a, it's a side, side journey that is, uh, that's not adding anything to the story of Bill and Frank. Um, and so we just completely deleted that because it was about just getting them down there to see what Bill and Frank had done. And what the, uh, the getting Ellie closer to that gun that she was like, I love a gun uh, because that was the story. So the closer we would uh, could connect the story together, that's what we would do. How about you, Emily? Any thoughts or? Uh, no, no, I mean, the, the, the biggest episode, I think, with some deleted stuff was that episode Tim's talking yeah. about. And I think that's the probably one of the better examples Um that. Yeah, I, that's all I yeah, can think of. We never really uh, were like, oh, don't steal that scene. 
So it was, <laughs> it was, it was, it, yeah. it was always like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Always for the better of the story. It's always felt like it. Yeah. And you know, it, always it, what's great about Craig is that he discusses everything with us in terms of story and character. And he says, he goes, well, what is this doing for the story? It's not doing anything. Right. And we're like, no, no. And, and, you know, having, you know, Jack Lesko in with us, she's like our bellwether. Um, she's like, literally like when, when, when Jack <laughs> Lesko is emotional, we know it's going to work. When Jack Lesko is scared, we know it's going to work. It's un it's unbelievable. She was like, she really is like, uh, she understands exactly how the audience is going to feel. She's like, a, a, she's a, she's my favorite person to have in editing because I just know uh, that her reaction is going to speak for everyone. Right. She's the best. Tim would like stop editing when we were working on a scene. He'd be like, I need to go get Jack. And he'd run down the hallway and bring her back yeah. to show the scene. It was yeah. just and the best. If she, if she approved, I felt so good because it was like, oh, I know it's going to work now. Yeah. Because she has the, the most exquisite taste. Oh, uh, that's that's really great. And I'm sure it's great for her, too. Like, wow, people really want my input. Oh, yeah. You know, value my input. Um, so is there two editors on each episode or are there more? Is there like a lead editor? And then, um, you know, how does that work? And then is it like an A story, B story, C story? And then somebody takes on one part of the story. Somebody takes on another. How does the editing collaboration work between that's a good question. And, you know, this is this is atypical, this experience. Um, normally, the experience is you have uh, multiple editors that work on, on separate episodes uh, in a in a rotation. Um, and that might have been what we did on Last of Us. And it started to be what we did on Last of Us. But after episode three, you know, Emily and I were really lucky that Craig was just like, uh, you guys are doing the thing I want to be doing. And I think you need to do them all. Uh, or as many as I can get you to do. And it was, it was daunting, of course. But then I, and that's one of the reasons why we, we had to do it together because I said, I really, 20 day shoots are basically the independent feature length shoot. So if you're doing uh, nine independent features all back to back to back to back, you're never going to make it. Um, and so I, I would, I just said, well, this, the only way this works is if Emily can work with me, because then we can sort of divide and conquer all of these episodes. We knew they were great scripts. We knew that the performances were amazing, but we really had to sort of stay afloat as well, because going through the process of director's cuts and producer cuts, the filming isn't stopping. The filming continues, so you have to stay caught up as well. Um, and sometimes they would just say, just, we're going to deal with that episode a little bit later, um, but we have to get through it. And so in terms of, uh, Emily, if you want to talk about how we divide things up. Yeah, generally we will divide things up based on what we're getting on the day. So like we kind of split the workload. But when we can, we will take storylines that kind of go along the same thread. Like, for instance, on the finale episode, I was able to cut the Anna sequence and, the Mar and then Marlene. And then I generally was able to get as many Marlene sequences as I could in that one. It doesn't always work where you can do the entire storyline because of just what we're getting in. But we do try to break it up where Tim, you know, took a lot of the Tommy and Joel scenes in the Jackson episode. And I took a lot of the Maria scenes and the Ellie and the Maria and Ellie scenes. And so we do try to do that when we can, because it's it's nice to have that thread and to be able to continue that storyline as an editor and see it through. And how do you share a project? I mean, are you both working on the same project or how do you put them together? If yeah. both are working separately. I mean, luckily, a Avid is very easy that way. It uh, allows you to, to work on a single project and. You know, as long as one person, only one person is allowed into a sequence at a time. Um, but, you know, as soon as I close something down, I can say, oh, Emily, open open up what I was just working on. Okay, It's very it. simple. And, and that's the beauty of uh, the Avid is it has so many different users. So our visual effects team was tied into the same material that we were. So we would just close close our window and say, hey, Luke, go open up this, uh, this window and then you can uh, work on what we just finished. Oh, well, that works well. It sure does. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, over the years, you would figure that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would not be something you're figuring out on the show. Exactly. I was just kind of curious, like, um, can you talk about the collaborative nature of editing a series like The Last of Us and how it differed from possibly editing other projects? Like, was there anything different between, like, the Umbrella Academy? Um, Umbrella, yeah, Umbrella Academy, because we were remote, we didn't have a ton of collaboration with the other editors. And that's the thing. 
Um, it's trickier when you can't really design time to go over things with editors when they're not in the same room with you and you don't understand their schedules. And a lot of times if editors are working from home, they design entirely different, you know, lifestyles. They say, oh, I work from, uh, you know, 4 p.m. to 2 a.m. Um, because that's just the way it works for me. So either I have a, a kid that I want to spend time with or la, la, la. And so you don't, you generally don't get a chance to collaborate. So we really didn't. You know, we never sort of saw each other's uh, projects. So each episode uh, of Umbrella Academy is shepherded by the executive producer. And that's great, you know, because they understand what each episode is trying to do story-wise and each uh, is trying to do stylistically. Um, so they can understand that. What I think helped on Last of Us is because we were in person and because we were able to talk to one another, you know, I would look at something that, for example, uh, we had some editors who came in and helped us you know, Mark Hartzell and Cindy Mallow, and we would be able to talk back and forth. And, you know, Cindy and I would say, oh, you know, in this sequence that I'm doing, it's really cold um, in, 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 in my episode. So maybe the episode before, it's not as cold in yours. So we have a little contrast between the two. And I said, oh, that's a really good idea. And so we would be able to talk episode to episode how you would create contrast and difference between them to help tell the, the environmental story. Um, so it was really nice to be able to talk to people and sort of share, uh, the work that you're doing, um, because it would also inform the work that, you know, that I would do. And what Emily would do is that we would say, oh, that's how they were doing this. That's really cool. And, uh, and then, you know, they feed back to us, we feed back to them. It's very, very nice to, to do that again with editors. It's lovely because again, they understand how, uh, all this stuff gets put together. Um, Emily, you have anything there? Yeah, no, you covered it. Well, now, uh, Emily, now that you're a co-editor with Tim, um, do you both have separate assistant editors or do you have the same assistant editor ha. or couple? Ha. <laughs> em Emily was doing <laughs> everything. It was insane. Um, we actually had a couple of uh, additional assistant editors uh, on The Last of Us. Thank goodness for them. Um, so Tim. Yeah, yeah so they Tim were really Cooper helpful. And, and Mr. Ben, our, our, our super tall man from Dallas, uh, Ben Cook. Um, and, uh, Ryan, uh, Andrew, oh, and, oh, and Andrew, Andrew McGivney. McGivney, that guy was our like saving grace. That guy was amazing. He was always remote though, yeah. uh, because he was doing all the turnovers and every day there were like five turnovers a day. Um, so I remember when we'd get him in the office, we're like, Andrew, come join us, please. Um, but we had like a really great yeah. sort of backup there. Um, but you know, as you know, you know, the, the, the hope right now is that Emily will no longer be a co-editor. Emily will be an editor in and of uh, itself. And so that's that's the plan. I'm hoping the plan works. Um, and then, you know, she will be able to hire her own assistant. And then I will have to, once again, uh, go out in the world and find somebody new, some some Aww. new recruit. So I know that must be tough, you know? a little tough, like where I, I want to say your little baby, you know, it's like yeah. the person that you nurtured <laughs> yeah. and now is going to have to fly. And then how do you feel, Emily? I mean, now you're going to go off like, you know, and be your own editor and then have your own assistant. And and that may mean projects may vary. You may go in. I know. Right. We're going to have to split yeah. at some point. I, I mean. It's like it's bittersweet because uh, I feel very ready for it, very excited yeah. to be editing and, and to be on my own. But also, like, I love Tim. I love working for Tim. I would still uh, with. Yeah, with. Um, but, you know, it's just like uh, he's the best. And, and I and even just being off recently, it's like I miss Tim. Like I miss working with him. Like and we have just, a ton of fun. I mean, I, that's know. the thing. I always I, yeah. I, I, I love going to work and saying, God, how, how lucky are we? You know, let's just have fun. Let's let's not be too serious here. I mean, obviously we're working on serious things, but if you if you if you yeah. take them so serious that everything is like, you know, professional and whatnot, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm always just trying to tell a bad dad joke um, here yeah. and there. So yeah, it's a yep. balance. You know, we have a lot of fun. We have a lot of laughs, but we also work That's very right. hard and spend a lot of time, um, you know, working on things. But yeah, I think that the balance is the best. Like we figured out the perfect balance. I felt like on this show, and and it was just great. Um, never felt so. long. Never felt like we were there too long, and we never were. Honestly, I mean, they, there was no, such an efficiency just, to the way yeah. we worked that it was. I don't remember uh, any like all all weekend work. I don't remember those at all. So considering no. we were on a accelerated schedule the whole time. Yeah. 
Well, I know. it's great when you work with people that you like. You know, it's like another family that you get to get excited than going to work and you don't really care for the people that you're working with. It it makes uh, the hours very daunting. Versus it is a, a, it is a dream. For... It is an absolute yes. dream to have that uh, experience. Now, um, there'll be a season two. Right? Yes. And um, you guys will continue on. So what is that, you know, with the writer's strike and everything, Are how are you guys doing? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, you're, we're, are you, we're, all, you're all off, We're right? all off, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it was a yeah. long 18 months, so I actually am kind of enjoying being back in the wild um, uh, and, and reminding myself, oh, right, there's a park here. Um, we live near yeah. the ocean. Oh my God. Um, there's like friends I haven't seen in like two years. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm luckily and very privileged to be able to take some time to relax again, um, and to recharge. Um, because I always, I don't feel like I can go back into something without having a little bit of a recharge. Um, so for me, that's my plan. It's a uh, it's a lucky plan. And Emily, what is your plan? Uh, my plan is very similar. I have been doing housework and hanging out with my dogs and my wife and doing some traveling. So that's about uh, all I've been yeah. doing. I yeah. think you have to embrace the time yeah. that you have because you won't always have this. Yeah. So it's kind of nice yeah, to exactly to just relax. And how know? can we bring and, and in, how can we bring insight into relationships and characters if we don't live our own lives? There's no way. Exactly. So. Yeah. yeah. So do you guys have any last thoughts that you want to leave our listeners with, with getting into editing, telling story or I would just say about life? my, 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 in, if anyone's interested in editing, find editors that are, are working and ask to see, to just ask them, um, can I buy you a coffee? Can I, this, can I, you know, if you're, if there's ever a time I could, you know, is there a, a an editing mixer? Is there something I can go to where I would like to meet other editors. I find editors to be so generous um, and so giving because a lot of times, you know, we are considered, you know, these invisible uh, artists. Um, and so I find that, you know, when people ask us things, we're very happy to, to, to help. And, and if you are lucky enough to be on a, a job where you're close to editors, um, Ask, again, ask them, you know, what are you doing? Do you mind if I sit in and just sort of watch what you do at some point? Because that's how I learned. Um, I learned by watching other people do it. Uh, and that's the only way I really, truly got to understand how it works the best and how it sometimes can work not so well. Um, and the other thing is, if you are hired in any capacity, come with an amazing uh, attitude every day and people will not forget you. Yeah, and I... So, so agree with what Tim is talking about. And I would just say that as an assistant, when you're on a show, find editors that want you to come in to, to, to learn from them and stick with those people. Those are the people that you're going to learn from. And also be open to to absorbing kind of their knowledge because editors, everyone has different approaches and everyone has things to teach you. And I think it's important to be open to learning those things and accepting that, like, we don't know everything. Like, we can always be learning. And I think also giving yourself the time to grow and not just expecting to edit immediately, because I think taking the time to move up is really helpful because for me, at least, it's like all the years that I was, was assisting and not fully moving up, uh, I was learning and, and getting to the place I needed to be. So I think taking that time is also really important. Yeah, don't rush it. Editors in scripted television are on the avid. If somebody doesn't know the Avid but knows how to edit, like in Premiere and the other um, editing softwares, do you think that they can make the jump into figuring it out? So do they need to worry about knowing Avid or not as an assistant editor? Uh, they can learn it overnight. That's what I did. I learned it okay. overnight in 1998 and never looked back. Um, so I, I feel like they're very similar uh, uh, sort of um, because it, editing ultimately is very similar. Um, right. So I feel like the the systems are all they all have their their quirks, but they all have a very strong basis in you know having dailies in one side, and then having the cut in the other, and having a timeline. Uh, it's just finding out the the sort of the uh, eccentricities of each system. Um, so I don't I don't think anyone should ever worry about it. You can easily learn it, and one of the ways to learn it is just to you know find someone who has it, and take a a scene or a piece of footage or something that you have from your project. 
and load it up there and uh, try and do the things that you do in your uh, uh, in Premiere on the Avid. Yeah, I think once you set up your keyboard and you know yep. like all the like the differences and like what the things do, that helps. And then also when I like, there's still things that come up in Avid that I don't know how to do sometimes. Like I've been on Avid for like 12 years now, but it's like you can always search on Google. You can say, how do I do this specific thing? Creative Cal is super helpful. There's mess, there's boards on like, I think Avid has boards, like there's YouTube videos. I think that if people are worried about not knowing it, the best way to approach that is just to start learning it yourself. And also there's like Avid certification courses. I know those are expensive, but I think if you could even just get hold of the books that come with those classes, you can read through those books and those are super helpful and talk about lots of hotkeys yep. and things that you can use. So- there's lots of ways. That's really mm -hmm. cool. Yep. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, thank you so much, Tammy. Thank you for yeah. having us. Thank you so much for listening. I encourage you to get out there and make a film. Reach out to your local filmmakers group to get involved and connect. Please subscribe to the show if you like it. And follow me on Instagram at Tammy McGarrow. Until we meet again, what's your story? Come on.